Great. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining our webinar, Diving into Water Security Validation. I am Lynn Abramson, the president of the Clean Energy Business Network, and I'm also joined on this call by my colleague, Andy Barnes. And I wanted to just go over a few quick housekeeping notes before we get started. First of all, please keep yourselves muted so we can avoid background noise. But at any point during this webinar, you can up to the chat button and send a message to the host, and we will save some time for questions at the end. We are also recording this webinar and we will distribute the recording and slides to all registrants. So for our agenda today, I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the American Made Challenges Program, as well as some of the current issues with water scarcity and the needs for the desalination industry. Then we're going to turn to Sarah Gomach, who is the American Made Prize Program Project Lead at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And I'll tell you a little bit more in just a moment what those American Made challenges are all about. We're going to, and Sarah's going to talk a little bit about the goals of the Solar Desalination Prize, which is currently in its second round. Then we will hear from Gary Katz, the founder of Katz Water Technologies, who is a previous prize semifinalist. He's currently uh, competing with his innovation and has been whittled down to one of only seven semifinalists. So we are really looking forward to hearing more from Gary about his experience with the prize program, as well as the innovations that he's developing. So first, just as quick background for those of you unfamiliar with the Clean Energy Business Network, we are the small business voice for the clean energy economy working to support more than 5,000 small and mid-sized clean energy companies nationwide across a very, very broad spectrum of technologies. And we assist these companies through policy engagement, market and technology education, and business development assistance. We were thrilled in November 2020 to be selected as one of the power connectors, an organization to help support the Department of Energy's American Made Challenges Program which leverages prize competitions to lower the barriers US-based innovators face in reaching manufacturing scale and accelerate the development of new technologies. The program uses a series of prize contests, as I mentioned, as well as the development of a diverse and powerful support network that leverages national laboratories, energy incubators, and other resources across the country. This is called the American Made Network. And Sarah will talk a little bit further about how you can access information about the prize competitions in just a moment. So first, let's just set the stage for the water crisis and the need for desalinization. Less than 1% of the water on Earth is suitable for consumption. And as a result, we face critical water shortages in countries across the world. 1.6 billion people currently face economic water shortage, so access to free to, to uh, clean potable water that is economically viable. And 1.2 billion people live in areas of physical scarcity. And this is not just overseas. We see these shortages within the United States. 40 U.S. states are reportedly facing water shortages in the next decade. And we actually see this at play right now across the Western United States, which is in the midst of a prolonged drought. The Bureau of Reclamation released figures just yesterday saying that the Colorado River reservoirs are catastrophically low. And the lower basin states of Arizona, Nevada, and, Carol and, and California are likely facing extreme curtailments to avoid Lake Mead falling into Deadpool and Glen Canyon Dam falling below the minimum power levels. So this is a serious crisis. Climate change and growing populations are only further exacerbating these challenges. So a whole host of solutions are needed from conservation, new ways to make do with less water, um, as well as the production of new fresh water supplies from technologies such as design. This is a brief overview from the International Desalination, Desalination, sorry, International Desalination Association of the seven general categories of desalination technologies currently available. And they're grouped into three basic categories based on the energy source. So there's thermal or heat energy, mechanical energy, which is really um, 
pressure driven based approaches such as reverse osmosis and electrical energy such as electrodialysis. We most typically see the reverse osmosis being used in small scales or for brackish water that doesn't have a very high salt content. And today we're going to focus on thermal energy as that is the goal, that is the, the approach being used by this prize competition. And um, <clears throat> dating back, you know, hundreds of years, but then to modern desalinization plants, we see a range of thermal energy approaches, um, typically at the current stage, really for the last half of a century, we've seen multi-stage flash, eva flash evaporation become dominant approach. Um, <clears throat> but really, you know, when you boil it down, pun intended, the approach of Thermal desalinization is fairly simple, and it's based on um, essentially, you know, multi-stage flash evaporation using heat to evaporate suddenly, or what they call flash, the water, and then cooling it to condense the fresh droplets into a collector. So let's talk about some of the challenges currently facing desalination. First, let's talk about the different types of industries or, or needs that are um, appropriate for desalinization. So we have communities that need drinking water, industrial facilities that need very, frequently they need very pure water, even purer than drinking water. Um, and this could be boiler feed water or other sources of use. Um, we also have agricultural water needed for irrigation, and then some wastewater treatment facilities need fresh water to um, help, you know, with surface discharge. So what are the salt water sources and the removal needs to support these kinds of applications? So first of all, seawater is a 35,000 part per, parts per meter total dissolved solids concentration on average. But the range can be anywhere as low as 20,000 to 55,000 parts per meter or more. So if you were to try to distill that down to potable water, you would need to do roughly a 99% removal of the total dissolved solids, solids for potable use. Brackish waters are where you have waters that are um, somewhat fresh, have a lower salt content. We'll find this in estuaries as well as groundwater where there is some seawater intrusion. We have a lot of that in California, as I'm sure those of you based out there know. Um, big challenge with some of the agricultural communities that draw upon groundwater for their um, irrigation use. And the, the salt concentrations can be anywhere from 1500 to you know, 20,000 parts per meter, so a broad range. Meanwhile, the minimum recommended drinking water requirements are to get the water below 500 parts per meter of dissolved solids and very high quality is on the order of about 50 parts per meter. And as I mentioned earlier, some industrial water requirements may require even purer forms of water. So at a basic level, to, to use the salt water sources, we have to remove anywhere from one third to 99% of the total dissolved solids. Um, so this is an extreme challenge. Some of the issues are um, the costs. So first of all, you know, typically to be commercially viable as a water source, it's necessary to remove the solids for less than a dollar per cubic meter in total product water costs. This may change as water scarcity um, you know, is further exacerbated, but that's sort of the recommendation currently for the industry. The energy use can be quite intensive. It often requires 10 times more energy to, to produce desalinated water than traditional water treatment methods. Um, and I mentioned that's particularly true in pressure-based approaches, such as reverse osmosis. And then there are environmental challenges, such as the disposal of the brine, which often is produced in liquid, you know, high concentration format, um, but it is possible to produce in solid format as well. So this brings us to the motivation of the American Made uh, Solar Desalinization Prize, which is to find new applications of solar thermal desalination. So the reasons for this are um, there are certain challenges with pressure-based technologies, 
as I mentioned, reverse osmosis can be very inefficient or energy intensive when it's very high salt content or when a high degree of purification is needed. Additionally, I mentioned the environmental impacts um, for inland environments, disposing of the brine produced can be challenging. And so there are some cases where some zero liquid discharge may be needed. So the solar thermal can pose some advantages in certain applications. Um, one of the one of the advantages is the fact that you typically have co-location of the geographic areas that have high solar irradiation, um, as well as heat and water stress. But intuitive, these things tend to go together. So um, solar can be a very useful energy source in the locations where we need desalinization the most. Also, um, it can be very feasible and cost effective to store thermal energy in hot liquids. So solar can be a good application where storage of the energy is needed. And additionally, solar can help with evaporation and produce solid disposal options for inland areas where the brine disposal is limited. So this has motivated the Department of Energy as Part of the water security grand challenge, which is exploring a whole range of solutions to the water scarcity crisis um, to launch this, this solar desalination prize. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, who is, as I mentioned, a program manager at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which helps administer the American Made Challenges program. And she'll tell us a little bit more about the goals of the program as well as how to apply. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks everyone for being here today. As Lynn mentioned, my name is Sarah Gomash. I'm with the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, working on the American Made Challenges programs. And I think Lynn did a really great job of giving an overview of the opportunity and the need for solar desalination. And I'm excited to present to you today um, an opportunity for you to submit kind of innovative ideas in this space and get funding and support. Uh, next slide, please. So the solar desalination prize has two components. Uh, the first component is a four stage prize competition to accelerate efforts to develop innovative solar desalination concepts into commercially viable products. Um, we have about $15 million in cash prizes available across two rounds of the prize. As Lynn mentioned, uh, Gary, who will speak next, is participating in the first round of the prize. The second round of the prize is open right now to anyone uh, to put in a submission by July 15th, which is next Thursday, but uh, the submission process is pretty straightforward and I hope that you all will consider putting an idea in. The second piece and what I think makes these prizes really exciting is the support of the American Made Network. So you have organizations like Clean Business, um, like the Clean Energy Business Network there to support you and help you along the way and make sure you're successful in the prize program. Next slide. So the goal of the prize is really to develop innovative solar thermal desalination concepts into commercially viable products. Um, we seek innovations relative to all desalination related end uses. So including generating both potable and non-potable water uh, while minimizing the concentrated brine generation from a variety of inputs. So it could be seawater, it could be inland brackish water, agricultural drainage, oil and gas extraction produced water. Um, solutions could be on or off the coast, on or off grid, small, medium or large throughput. Um, basically we're looking for kind of any innovative idea that's related to solar thermal desalination. We don't have a lot of specifications about what that system requirement needs to be, mostly because we want to kind of cast a really broad net and get the best ideas um, around. Do note, um, as Lynn mentioned earlier, this prize does not target desalination technologies that are primarily electrically powered. We are looking for that thermal component. Next slide. So the prize consists of four consecutive contests. And I think the thing that makes prizes different and more exciting than something like a grant is we're awarding you for work that you've already done. 
Um, so you do your work, you put in a submission, and then we award you a cash prize, straight cash prize, no strings attached. You use it however, however is most important and valuable to you. Um, so we're in the first contest right now, the innovation stage. Um, each contest includes a period where the competitors work to advance your solution kind of according to the guidelines that we've laid out. Um, and then the contest will end with a testing of your prototype uh, at a test facility using high saline water. So in the first phase of the competition, that's where we are now, innovation. We're looking for individuals, groups of competitors, companies, academic institutions, anyone out there to demonstrate that you have a novel and feasible concept for a technology that can deliver desalinated water using solar thermal energy. Um, especially in round two, we'll also take submissions that focus more heavily just on that solar thermal energy piece. Um, your innovation can be an entire system uh, or just a system component. And the winners here get $50,000 cash prize each and get to move on to the next phase of the competition. Um, note to compete in any of the next phases, you have to have submitted and won to the innovation phase. So I can't encourage you enough to think about your submission, get it pulled together over the weekend and put something in for that July 15th deadline because this is where it all starts. After teams have won the first phase, uh, the second contest is called teaming. You'll work to establish and solidify a cross-functional project team uh, that can really take your preliminary concept into a fully operational prototype. So again, wanna emphasize at this stage, we're just looking for a concept and as you work through the prize stages, you can really refine that concept into a prototype. Um, if you win the teaming contest, which Gary has done, you'll win $250,000 of cash prize each and a voucher to work with a national lab or facility in the American Made Network. You'll then move on to the design phase, the third contest, where you'll work to complete a detailed design and get your solution shovel ready. Um, winners of this phase will win $750,000 cash prize each. Move on to the test phase where you build your prototype system and demonstrate it and you win a million dollar cash prize. So if you make it through all four contests, there's more than 200 or more than $2 million of cash prizes available to you um, and a lot of support to help you make it through these rounds. So again, we're in innovation now. It closes on Thursday, but I really encourage you to put, put in your submission. Next slide, please. So a question we often get is who's eligible to compete in this innovation phase? Um, private entities, academic institutions, and individuals can compete as long as they meet these criteria. Private entities must be incorporated in and maintain a primary place of business in the United States with the majority domestic ownership and control. Um, if an entity is seeking to compete, does not have domestic ownership and control, but otherwise meets the requirements, uh, we can consider issuing a waiver of that eligibility requirement. And there's more information in the official rules. Academic institutions must be based in the US. Um, individuals must be a US citizen or a permanent resident. A group of individuals can compete. Uh, provided that the online account holder of the submission is a U.S. citizen and permanent resident. Um, for later contests, we do ask that you incorporate or be part of an entity, but in this first phase, the innovation phase, you can definitely compete as an individual. Um, next slide. Uh, so for the innovation contest, as we've mentioned, the goal is to identify impactful technology innovations that will likely result in a successful operational prototype. Uh, you'll win $50,000 and move on to the next contest. We definitely encourage you to refer to the official rules that has all of the details on how you can apply um, and all of the criteria. And the submission deadline again is July 15th, this coming Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Next slide. So I hope all of you right now are saying, yes, I have a super innovative idea. I've been inspired by Lynn. I wanna be like Gary, um, what do I do to apply? So head over to the website. Uh, we use a platform called HeroX. And so the URL is right here. Uh, head over, click to solve this challenge um, and you'll be able to pull up the submission form. This is the website that you'll use to put in your submission. 
Um, we also have resources available for you there, like the rules, a submission template, um, more webinar guidance. Everything you need is right there. So head on over, solve the challenge, and submit um, your submission through the HeroX portal. Next slide. So what exactly do you need to submit? Um, the first thing is a 90 second video, which we'll make publicly accessible online. Um, I think sometimes this is the most intimidating part for people, but it shouldn't be really. We're not looking for a big uh, Steven Spielberg production. Have your friend film you on their iPhone. Tell us about you. Tell us about your idea. Uh, show us any visuals that you have, but it can be quite simple. Um, a lot of times we kind of use this as our first introduction and overview. Um, the next thing you'll submit is just a cover page with some basic information about your team. And then finally, a technical narrative that has three questions. Uh, does your submission describe a novel solution that can deliver desalinated water using solar thermal energy? Is your solution technically feasible? And will it be impactful? Um, the whole technical narrative is limited to 2,500 words, so it's not super long. Uh, you can decide kind of how among those questions to split your word count, but kind of give us the information. What is it? Why will it be successful? Um, and why is it impactful? Then we just ask for a summary PowerPoint slide, um, just kind of summarizing your submission in one slide. And then if you have any letters of commitment or support, we'll take them, but they are entirely optional. Um, so I think the submission package you could definitely put together over the weekend, uh, submit it with your idea, but these are the components that we'll be looking for. Uh, next slide. And finally, just a reminder, why compete? Uh, if you make it through all four stages, as I mentioned, there's more than $2 million in cash prizes available. There's over $200,000 in vouchers uh, where you can get access to national labs and other organizations in our network. And we have a network of over 200 organizations that are here and ready to support you to help you find those right team members, um, to help you with your submission, to help you with your business plan. Uh, Clean Energy Business Network is definitely one of those, so reach out to them. There are also another couple connectors on the website. Um, they've posted in the HeroX forum and are there to help you. Uh, so I really hope that you take advantage of this opportunity to help address some of those challenges that Lynn talked through earlier today and really to be a part of this prize program. And I think with that, I'll turn it over uh, either back to Lynn or to Gary. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate that overview. And just to reiterate your offer for support from CEBN and other connectors, um, I'll review this again at the end of the webinar, but myself and my colleague Andy, we're both happy to answer any questions that competitors may have, look over application materials, and, um, you know, just to reiterate the point that it is a very straightforward, fairly short application. This is something that you can accomplish. Um, and to the point of the video, um, if anyone needs tips on producing videos, we have used a number of really simple kind of free and low cost tools, such as um, PowerPoint animations, as well as a software called Adobe um, Spark to make videos for CEBN. So I'm happy to chat with anyone who needs tips on just how to do that very easily and, and cost effectively. So um, really appreciate that overview. And with that, I'm really thrilled to introduce Gary Katz, founder of Katz Water Technologies, which is one of the seven semifinalists of the first round of the Solar Desalination Prize. Um, and we did receive a question in the chat, I'll just note asking about how this challenge is different from the desalination ch challenge that it closed in October of 2020. Um, I'll let Sarah elaborate on this later, but uh, essentially this is the same kind of an idea. The, the, um, the American Made Challenges often does multiple rounds looking for new and improved technologies. So for example, the American Made Solar Prize is now on its fifth round of searching for innovative solar technology. So based on the success of the first desalination round, uh, DOE is going back out there to look for, you know, further ideas. So we are excited to introduce Gary. He will tell us a little bit more about his company's 
expansion and pivot from oil and gas industry into looking at solar desalination technologies and the work that they're doing from the with the prize competition as well as how the competition was helpful to his company. So Gary, over to you. Uh, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Sarah. Um, as uh, Lynn mentioned, I'm the CEO of Cats Water Technologies. We were founded in 2016 to help solve the uh, world's water problems, and I'll talk about our technology a little bit as I discuss uh, our experience in the uh, solar desalinization uh, prize competition or round one. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, say that this is an incredible honor to be speaking with uh, Lynn and Sarah. In the past, I used uh, Lynn and Sarah as a resource to help me uh, in this process. And now I'm actually uh, helping them and uh, helping others. So this is a great experience and a great honor to be on this webinar. <laughs> And I encourage everyone to use both uh, Lynn and Sarah as a resource. They're here to help us. And uh, they're great resources, and there's many great resources in the program. And I encourage, I, can someone mute themselves? I think we have, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, there's, we're having some back talk. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, so I would encourage everyone to use Lynn, Sarah, and everyone in the uh, network as a resource. Next slide, please. Hello? Okay, so uh, before we talk about the technology, and this is probably uh, one of the best tips I can give you or most important tips that I can give everyone looking to compete is focus on the market or more specifically, focus on your customer needs. We all have great technology. A lot of us, I'm an engineer by trade uh, and technology is my heart and soul, but you have to focus on the market in particular the customer needs and then make sure that your technology meets a customer need or has a product market fit. So initially, and we'll talk about the pivot, is we were entirely focused on oil and gas. We were looking at the technology to uh, clean up produced water, which is a uh, multi-billion dollar problem in the oil and gas industry. So. Uh, at the well sites, uh, they have to remove the uh, and separate the uh, oil, the gas, and the water from the uh, uh, production uh, fluids that come up. And uh, handling and disposing that produced water, which is heavily contaminated, represents about 55% of their operating costs. So uh, initially, we saw this technology as a way to uh, reduce their uh, costs and give them clean water that they can renew on site. And I think that there is definitely a market opportunity, but we also, and thanks to this prize, was able to pivot and focus on a new, more sustainable. So in the oil and gas uh, fields, we use natural gas, which is on the site in order, as our thermal source, we burn it inside our heat exchanger and produce the heat for the distillation through that process. So one of the great things that allowed us was to take a the uh, DOD solar desalinization is to take the concept of instead of powering our heat exchangers with uh, natural gas being burned to power with solar thermal. And uh, that would be particularly useful in remote areas where you don't have uh, heavy power or natural gas, particularly agriculture and uh, drinking water, maybe in uh, some of the uh, third world countries that desperately need uh, new sources of drinking water. And we're also looking at the defense and disaster release uh, operating in remote areas. There's a, definitely a need for uh, uh, clean, renewable water uh, and also of uh, treating contaminated water. And the Air Force is actually very interested in a remote system that they can, a solar powered system that they can use in remote uh, uh, areas. So how does our solution address these needs? Well, we came up with a sustainable one that we can run it on uh, solar uh, thermal power and solar PV. Uh, you can see Aaron uh, Picton, who led our efforts on the DOE's desalinization on the bottom right, uh, using our first system at a farm in uh, Texas, in which uh, this was a small proof of concept where we used a system from Arctic Solar. I think uh, uh, Arctic Solar is on this call. And we're able to show that we're able to 
on a system run purely on uh, solar thermal, uh, and also the pumps were run on solar PV, uh, distill and purify the uh, water. And then actually you can compare it to our oil and gas system on the top right, where you can see Antonio Hernandez unloading the system at an oil and gas well site in Texas, and that inside that trailer, we hook up to the natural gas and able to purify water. So we moved from a natural gas system to a more sustainable uh, solar thermal uh, and solar PV system. It's a mobile system. As you can see, uh, we designed it to fit in a trailer. And for the Air Force, we're looking at uh, putting everything in trailer, including the uh, solar thermal unit. It's self-contained. I'll show a picture later as I describe the technology. And modular, which allows us to scale up so we can address small needs as well as very large needs. OK, next uh, slide, please. So uh, one of the things is, is that uh, requirements is to do a video. So this is one of the slides that we did for the video, which was a schematic. And uh, people are afraid of videos. We were very afraid of it. Don't be. There's a lot of great options on it. We wound up using Fiverr and spending $300 for a cartoon video. And people love it. And I've had other companies tell us that uh, it's a better video than what people spent uh, thousands of dollars on. So. Uh, uh, there are some great options. I know Lynn offered to help you on that. Uh, she's a great resource. And, uh, you know, another option would be uh, hiring an inexpensive uh, Fiverr consultant to do a uh, video, which we did. So as you can see, we have three main components. We have our heat source, which is the solar thermal unit, our XFAP. And now I'll talk about our technology. We patented the ability to do the entire thermal distillation process inside a heat exchanger. So in a small compact system, we're able to remove over 99% of the contaminants in a pass-through of under 12 seconds. And because it's uh, small compact, it's very inexpensive to build and inexpensive to operate and very, and very efficient. So it, uh, that's our XVAP uh, system and that's the core of the technology. So we hooked it up to a solar thermal system and then for our energy recapture to improve the energy, we actually recapture the energy of the vapor as we condense it and use it as a pre-warmer for our wastewater coming in. So we have our wastewater coming in, we have our solar thermal input in, and we get two uh, streams, the concentrated brine and the uh, purified water. And because we're doing a solar uh, a thermal distillation, we're able to concentrate the brine into very high concentrations so there's very little volume and of, uh, of brine and high volumes of water, as well as the ability to concentrate it so it can be reused as a heavy brine in oil and gas for a drilling mud, or we could uh, run it through a water press or crystallize it and take it to a solid if you need zero liquid discharge. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so there's the animation. You can see uh, the purified water. Cause okay, next slide, please. So I mentioned our core technology, and if I think if you go to the next slide, it gives an animation. So you can see our heat source coming in uh, through the outer rungs of the uh, fin tube uh, heat exchanger, our contaminated water coming in to the middle annulus, and our vapor coming out the top of the. Uh, 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 inner annulus and the brine falling out. So uh, this uh, one piece of equipment uh, replaces several process steps and the equipment uh, in these uh, traditional process steps are large, very costly, require energy as well as energy to pump from one to another. This is 100% uh, gravity fed, no mechanical moving parts. So it's very simple. Our efficiency is the efficiency of the heat exchanger. So we believe uh, we've created the most efficient use of solar thermal because we put it in a closed loop with the solar thermal system, and the only additional efficiency loss is the efficiency of the heat exchanger. So uh, our energy, our mass energy balance numbers are uh, remarkably uh, high and uh, and uh, reasonable to uh, get the cost down. Okay, next slide. So uh, you can see on the bottom left, the self-contained, uh, you can see we have three XVAPs in a trailer that we're building out, and we could build uh, 
uh, as the volume increases, we could add as many more. The top right shows a storage trailer with 100 uh, XFAPs in case for larger industrial use. And the bottom right was a use case that we did for the Air Force of having a trailer mounted version that could be moved by a military truck for remote operations. Um, one of the things, that, like I said before, always focus on the customer needs because the technology can be great, but unless you're addressing a specific cu uh, customer need, there's no market. So, uh, and obviously cost is important, but uh, sustainability is also important. I know the Air Force uh, is looking to be sustainable, and uh, also the logistical needs are, are enormous in order to send water and fuel to remote bases. So if they could have an on-site uh, system, that could ease up their logistical needs and save them a tremendous amount of money. So again, focus on the customer needs and make sure that your system is cost effective for what they need. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this, we talked about it, is, is that uh, you have to show that you're effective in removing the contaminants, whether it's salt or industrial contaminants. So this is a field test that we did at an oil and gas site in Spring, Texas, and we were able to remove 99% of the TDS in a throughput of under 12 seconds. You could see our, uh, our water assay using the uh, EPA uh, method and uh, uh, pretty much over 99% removal across the board. So we're able to take some of the most contaminated uh, industrial water you can find and turn it into near drinking water quality, um, at least water that can be reused for uh, agriculture and other uses. All right, next slide. So uh, uh, how we use the, uh, the uh, DOE uh, prize money in order to help us. So initially we were funded by the NSF. We got a phase zero grant, which is a customer discovery as part of our ICOR program phase one, which is a proof of concept, and a phase two, which we're currently in. We use that to develop our natural gas system for the oil and gas, which is almost ready for commercialization. That's a TRO-8. While that was going on, we also applied for the DUE solar desalinization prize. And at the time, uh, during round one, we were just a concept. And uh, we uh, listed our concept and how we'd like to pivot from uh, natural gas energy to more sustainable solar. And thankfully we were uh, advanced to the next round. And then, uh, and then we actually built using the money from uh, phase one, a small demonstration unit where we combined our XVAP with Arctic Solar's uh, uh, solar thermal system and was able to actually do a, a proof of concept at a farm. And that got us to TRL four. Um, and uh, we're actually now uh, using the money to design a, a system that's optimized for solar thermal to take uh, advantage of some of the uh, different properties of the solar thermal fluid, such as the higher energy dense, mass energy density, and uh, use that to create a much more system as well as a much more powerful uh, solar thermal array. One of the things that's great about the DOE Solar Prize is, is that it's a cash prize. You can use the money any way you want. So with the NSF grant, we're very limited on what we could spend it on. And we can only, we can't buy equipment. The DOE enabled us to buy machining equipment. And now we have several machinists working on our uh, systems and we're able to produce them much faster than taking them to a machine shop, as well as make changes very quickly. So it's been a tremendous benefit for us and I encourage everyone to apply and hopefully it will be a benefit to you. Now, if you win, great. And even if you don't win, I think it's worth uh, uh, working with them because it helps you advance the technology. Yes, I'll be the cash prize is, a, is a helpful, but in the end, you want to advance this technology, solve a customer need, and get it to market. And next slide, please. And okay, that's all. Um, uh, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that people have, talk about my uh, experience. And uh, another thing I'd like to mention is that the, there's a great networking. Uh, 
you know, uh, during the DOE, they had several online uh, networking events, and we met another solar provider that does uh, more uh, high-powered uh, uh, parabolic uh, mirrors, uh, Rockham, uh, and uh, we're going to be using them for our uh, next generation and uh, uh, see if the uh, higher temperatures and higher throughputs will give us uh, uh, much better uh, results. So. It's, this is an exciting process. I encourage everyone with great ideas to move forward, and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, during this, and you have my contact information and email if you want to contact me outside of this. Thank you, and uh, I'll mute myself and turn it back to Wynn. Great. Thank you so much, Gary. That was a terrific presentation and really exciting to see what you've accomplished with the DOE funding as well as the other sources of support. Um, and. Agree, really very awesome animation. So it seems like that was uh, funding well spent. And so um, I'm gonna invite Gary and Sarah to unmute themselves and we have a number of questions we have received in the chat and just wanna remind everyone that you can use the chat function to send us any questions that you have or you can email my colleague Andy if for some reason you're unable to access the chat. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Andy in just a moment to read some of the questions we've gotten relating to the prize, but uh, we have a number of questions specifically relating to Gary's technology. So I'm going to attempt to uh, kind of combine and summarize the start out. So uh, I guess a couple of questions for you, Gary, relating to the technology. One is what is the kilowatt tonnage proof of concept output daily volume? Okay, so I, um, our initial system that we used was uh, two Rockham uh, solar thermal uh, collectors, and each one of them, um, I hope I get this uh, it, it correct, I believe is 1.1 kilowatts, uh, uh, so we had a 2.2 system. The new system uh, that we're using with Rockham is going to be an over 10 kilowatt uh, uh, solar collector. So, uh, and we're going to try one and then maybe uh, uh, add additional ones as needed. So, uh, I encourage everyone to experiment. Uh, uh, we're still trying to figure, uh, get our calibration curves on the flow rates and the, uh, uh, the solar thermal input in order to maximize it. And uh, it's a learning curve for us. So, uh, so we're still in the process of learning it, but uh, I think uh, uh, if, for initial proof of concept, the Arctic Solar uh, was great for us because we were able to get some initial data points. And uh, uh, they also have the option of increasing it by running uh, many of them in uh, series or parallel, which is another option we can explore. So uh, uh, did I answer the question? Yeah, no, I think you did. Um, okay. We have a couple, I'm not sure if this is the same question. This may mean something differently too, so I'll read it. Um, one of our participants wanted to know what the desalinator heat exchanges output tonnage. I, th I think that's the same, but perhaps it's different. And they also wanted to know how the solar concentrators are moved for tracking. So I don't, I don't know if it's sort of solar tracking technology. Can you explain that further? Okay, so our initial proof of concept that we used to phase uh, one funding from the DOE did not have a tracking system, although we thought about building one for that. The uh, one that we're uh, using for, with our next round of funding that's on order from Rockham has a tracking system. It's a dual access tracking system. And uh, uh, we're scheduled to receive that in September. So uh, that's as far as tracking. So our initial proof of concept had no tracking. We just pointed it in the direction of the sun. And luckily we were able to get enough uh, uh, power from that to uh, do the proof of concept. And the uh, next system will have a uh, dual axis uh, tracker, which should help uh, with the uh, throughput. And then as far as the throughput, right now our uh, XFAPs are able to do uh, three liters per minute. Now, uh, uh, the goal of the DOE is to get to a hundred cubic meter per day uh, system. So uh, obviously we're gonna get there by uh, two ways. The first way is to increase the throughput of our uh, individual XPAC systems. And the, uh, 
Uh, the second uh, step is to actually add additional XVAPs and additional solar thermal input in order to uh, get that 100 cubic meter. So actually I changed it, I think I mentioned three liters. Our actual current is a, a little over a liter, but our goal is to get to uh, three, uh, three liters uh, per minute. So, uh, okay, so I think I answered both uh, the two part questions, the, uh, yeah. the tracking and the uh, uh, throughput. Great. Yes, I think so. And then one final technology question that we've received so far for you is, can you talk a little bit about how you handle fouling deposition of salt on the heat exchanger surface? That's a, that's a question yeah. I imagine many people will struggle with. Yes. Yeah, so, so excellent question. And uh, that's one of the hardest problems and one of the reasons why people uh, were moving away from uh, thermal desalinization because uh, particularly as you get to higher concentrations, scaling, fouling, and corrosion become a uh, bigger uh, problem. So what we did is we addressed it through several way, through several methods. And uh, if anyone wants a detailed write-up, it's in our initial uh, patent, app, uh, patent that was granted, is we designed a system that had no mechanical moving parts and was completely gravity fed. So our research had shown that uh, scaling and corrosion and fouling mostly occur when water sits. So by designing a system where it's 100% gravity fed and the water does not sit, we were able to reduce it drastically. Uh, you know, we also reduce the throughput time. We keep it to under 12 seconds, which also enables us to avoid scaling, fouling and corrosion. And the third way we do it is we use a very uh, high grade stainless steel that's corrosion uh, resistant. And uh, so far we have not had any problems uh, with scale except once where we went scaling, fouling and corrosion. One time we tried treating water that was over 300,000 TDS and at around uh, 320,000 TDS, we had a scaling incident in our pump where it scaled up and uh, caused fouling by going through. So uh, we could go up to 300,000 TDS, which is, we believe, a game changer that we can handle the uh, higher TDS. So obviously that's gonna be one of the questions that you're gonna be asked about, and it's one of the technical hurdles. So that's how we solved it. And I'm sure uh, others are gonna come up with creative ways to solve the scaling, fouling, and corrosion process. So uh, uh, let's do it and and uh, come up with your creative ways and let the DOE know about it because they want to fund uh, new ways to solve this problem. That's awesome. Thank you. And we do we have been receiving some additional technical questions for you, but I'm going to turn to some general program questions and then we can return to those. Um, but I'll also make sure to note who asked the questions and put them in touch in case we don't get to it. But I do want to turn to Sarah and I'm going to actually scroll back because we have a few questions relating to prior stages. So I want to um, pull that slide back up again um, so we can just talk through this further. So, uh, Sarah, I guess one of the questions we wanted to clarify, I think there's some confusion about the, the two rounds that have um, gone on. And uh, so basically, this is the launch of round two. We have some questions about the status of round one and where we are in that process. So can you just remind our listeners about the, the two ongoing sort of round robins of these, these prize competitions? Yeah, absolutely. So last year, we started round one, which was the first time we did this prize. Uh, we completed the innovation contest and the teaming contest. Those round one teams, Gary included, are currently in the design phase of the prize. Um, because we were so excited about all of the submissions that we got, we again uh, opened up the innovation contest for round two. So round two just meaning the second time that we've gone through this, but it's the first phase of the competition innovation and open to everyone. Um, so people that apply now will then uh, start the teaming contest in September and then move on to those phases. So we'll have kind of two rounds going at the same time. 
great. Thanks for clarifying that. And I guess also, um, are the overall goals of the both rounds similar or are there any kind of special areas of concern for round two? Uh, they're similar in round two. We've also just expanded a little bit to say uh, we're also really interested in kind of the thermal, th thermal energy storage uh, component. And so if you have kind of just that piece that maybe doesn't have a desalination component yet, uh, you're also eligible to submit that. Great. Uh, also, we had some questions relating to the, the deadlines, and I know that this prize is unusual compared to some of the others that move very quickly. And I think part of that is just given the very sort of tech heavy um, aspect of trying to design these systems. But um, so specifically on the design and testing phases where it, it sort of opens uh, in 2022 and closes in 2025. So, so competitors have three years in that stage. Um, we have some questions relating to, you know, if it's possible to move more quickly through the process in order to commercialize. So can you talk, just talk a little bit about how these deadlines are envisioned? Yeah, so the innovation and teaming contests have set deadlines, a set opening and a set close. July 15th for innovation. Um, and so if you miss that, you're out of luck. Um, the design and test contest, we realized that everyone's kind of in different places and some people will move fast and some people will move slow. And so those deadlines for contest three and four design and test um, are not as firm. And so we'll move people through those phases as soon as they've completed all of the requirements for it. So you'll see that the earliest you could be in that phase is April 2022, and the phase is open for up to three years. But if you finish early, you can move on to the next phase. Okay, great. So you don't have an, a set number of uh, applicants that you expect to award the test phase that's going to be on an individual basis? Correct. Okay, great. So I guess if you can move more quickly, go for it. Um, I would also just sort of reiterate what both Sarah and Gary said earlier, which is the ancillary benefits of this prize in terms of the connections you'll make, the exposure you'll get, the non-dilutive cash prizes. And, um, you know, if you are seeking to rapidly commercialize, I think there is really nothing quite like the American prizes to accomplish that, um, you know, because it's not grant based. There's, you don't have a lot of reporting to do. It's really just go, go, go as fast as you can with the, with the prize money. So I um, encourage people to think about that. We also have a question relating to eligibility for innovation. Um, so one of the uh, one of the listeners said, if we only have a technical design concept of the technology, but haven't proved this on a working model, can we still apply? And my understanding is absolutely that's what the innovation contest is all about. Yes, absolutely. I second that. Yeah. So this is what's so great is if you have a, a idea on paper. Put it in there, and the whole purpose of this purpose of this prize is to help you prove out that idea. Yeah, exactly, that and that. that's why everything's kind of phased. Is all we need is an idea at this point, and then you kind of move toward the next milestone, and the next milestone, and the next milestone. And we submitted our uh, our first phase con uh, round phase one as a uh, complete concept idea. And we we're able to use it in order to get it to a more advanced uh, prototype demonstration unit. So I, if you just have an idea and nothing other than an idea, I encourage you to apply. Great. We also got a question related to teaming. Um, so, you know, we've passed the teaming stage of round one, but if listeners have a component that might fit in with a round one finalist, is it still possible to partner with them on improving their design or or should they um, look at trying to put in an application for round two and, and team up with that partner? Uh, absolutely, both ways. Um, the first is you can go to the AmericanMadeChallenges.org website and there's information on all of the current semifinalist teams. Um, and so you can reach out to them if you want to get in touch that way and see if you can partner. Otherwise, we're always happy to take your submission in the innovation contest too. 
and spend some of the time in the teaming phase making connections uh, to some of the other teams as well. Great. And I would just also add, um, just for folks, you know, understanding that uh, if you have resources or interests to bring to bear that you think could be useful for any of the teams, please get in touch with me and Andy. Um, in addition to helping to promote information about this round two of the prize, we are going to be working to help support the semifinalists that are currently in the design stage, um, you know, meet potential partners, investors, work through the, the business and, and sort of market, um, tech, you know, customer discovery. So if you have ideas to bring to bear for any of our semifinalists, definitely reach out. We will be doing some customer discovery workshops, um, trying to introduce them to water agencies to kind of further refine what the market needs and opportunities are. So if you are in that category of having other technologies to offer, you know, to help improve existing designs or are a potential customer of these types of technologies, we really would love to have your, your guidance and expertise. So, so definitely reach out. Um, we have two more minutes remaining. I'm going to try to maybe follow up with those who asked more technical questions with Gary for Gary. But um, I guess one closing question for both of you is, do you have any advice for competitors in terms of what you know strategies you think can really help build a successful application or common mistakes that you think should be avoided? All right, I guess I'll take a crack at it. So one of the common mistakes is don't wait to the last minute to get letters of support. Obviously, the letters of supports are critical to show to DOE that there's customer interest or partner interest. And a lot of times uh, it takes a long time to uh, go back and forth and get the customer, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, work with and get and understand the process of writing a letter of support. So uh, try not to wait to the last minute. It's a relationship and uh, uh, explain to them the uh, competition, what you're doing and how to address their needs and let them know up front that you're going to need a letter of support because I've had people ask me uh, if I could help them get a letter of support uh, less than a week before the deadline. And that's it, it's probably not going to happen. It's just going to make the customer uncomfortable. I guess a, uh, another suggestion would be to uh, be honest in your proposal of what you need and where you are. The uh, DOE isn't looking for a perfect solution. If they would, they would buy off-the-shelf technology. They want to help people take innovative ideas to the marketplace. So accurately explain where you are and what you need and where you're heading so they can make a uh, real evaluation. And uh, I, I, I think it's actually will improve your chances if you list the problems that you need and uh, what you're going to do to address them. And I'll let Sarah opine on that too. Uh, Gary, I think your second point is really good to be honest in your submission. Uh, these are phased. We know your idea isn't perfect, and so that's okay. Don't try to hide it, um, and just remember the audience that you're putting in your submission materials for. Great. Well, excellent advice. Um, so it sounds like if you've not yet asked for your letters of rec, get on that today, and then you can keep working on the rest of your application materials over the next few days. And as Gary and, and Sarah said, be very clear and honest about where you are and what you need. Um, so I, I wanna say a huge thank you to Sarah and to Gary for sharing information about the prize competition and sharing your perspectives today. And thank you to everyone who dialed in. We will try to get our recording posted as soon as possible and circulate that to you. And if we weren't able to address your question on today's call, I did include everybody's contact information, but I'm happy to put you in touch with any of our speakers. So thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.